Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 3MT competition sponsored by the Graduate School. The 3MT is part of Graduate Student Appreciation Week and the Graduate School's Research Days. I would like to go over a couple housekeeping items with you. Uh, first of all, some overview, or overview and reminders. We do have 25 competitors from various, from various programs uh, that will be presenting their research today. The students will be presenting their research in three minutes or less using one static slide. Our judges, who will be introduced shortly, uh, will be scoring on comprehension, content, engagement, and communication. Uh, this program will be recorded. We ask that you remain muted um, with your camera turned off throughout the competition unless you're presenting, and that will be, of course, the students. The chat function can be used for congratu congratulatory comments, but there will be no Q&A as part of the presentations. Couple other items for optimal viewing once we actually start the student presentations. Uh, you can choose the view setting in the upper right corner, select the side-by-side -side speaker view, and then in increase the size of the speaker window by dragging it left. Throughout, <clears throat> we do, for those of you that are attending and also for uh, the uh, competitors, we do, we, we would encourage you to vote for People's Choice, which is a $200 award by clicking on the survey link in the chat, and I will be posting that link throughout the, uh, the competition. So just be looking for the link to the survey for People's Choice. You can go in and select your favorite. The winners of, <clears throat> the, winners of, of the uh, 3MT research competition will be announced at the Graduate Student Appreciation Week award ceremony tomorrow, April 9th from 12 to 1 p.m. And now what I would like to do is turn it over to our Vice Provost and Dean of the Graduate School, Dr. Ambika Matur. Thank you, John. So welcome to our 3 MT competition, which is the highlight of our Graduate Student Appreciation Week. I am looking forward to learning all about your research in three minutes or less. This should be really exciting. I can't wait to experience your wonderful talents here. So uh, I want to wish you all the best, all 25 of our competitors today. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank the judges who are going to be evaluating and providing their expertise as well. So thank you and welcome to the 3MT. And I'm now going to turn it back over to John. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. So if our judges would like to turn their cameras on, I would like to formally introduce them. Uh, first, we have Dr. Tracy Boss, who is the Assistant Dean <clears throat> for, gra excuse me, <clears throat> for graduate and postdoctoral success with the Graduate School. Uh, Daryl Balderrama, who is the Director of Undergraduate Research from the Office of Undergraduate Research. He also does his own 3MT competition or manages it. Uh, Jake Leal, who is a PhD candidate in cell and molecular biology, and he is our fall 2020 3MT winner. Michelle Shank, who is the Director of Employee, Employer Engagement with the University Career Center. And last but not least, a judge that has been with me for almost the past 10 years, judging every year for the 3MT, Dr. Mickey Stevenson, Associate Vice President for Research Administration from the Office of the Vice President for Research economic development and research enterprise. So thank you to all our judges for being here. Uh, judges at this time, if you can make sure that you have both the Zoom uh, window open and a window open to your score sheet that is located on Teams. So just to let everybody know what's at stake for our finals awards, the first place winner will receive $500, second place will receive $300, third place will receive 250, and People's Choice will be 200. So we are about to start the finals competition. At this point, please turn off your cameras and remain muted at this time. For our competitors, 
um, when your name comes up, or when your name comes up at that point, you're gonna wanna turn on your camera and unmute yourself and uh, we will wait for the judges to be to get ready between the students. We'll give the judges a couple minutes to enter their scores, and then we'll move on to the next uh, competitor. And um, so just like I said, just be watching for your name. Once we're ready to go, I'll advance to your slide. And let me get my, I'm also the timekeeper, so let me get my timer ready. Set for three minutes. And our first presenter is Farhad Akhtar from Mechanical Engineering. Farhad, anytime you're ready. Uh, excuse me, I can't see my face here. Can you guys see my face and hear my voice? Yes, indeed. Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. So let's begin. Hi, I'm Farhad Akhtar currently doing my PhD in mechanical engineering. Welcome to my talk on fiber optic microneedle device for the treatment of pancreatic cancer. Pancreas is an important organ of human body that releases different kinds of enzyme directly to the bloodstream to help the digestion process. Pancreatic cancer is a pretty known disease, especially for the elderly people. This is the second largest cause of cancer related death in United States. Each year, around 50,000 people die due to the disease. There are different treatment methods available, uh, including surgical removal, chemotherapy, or radiofrequency ablation, et cetera. But these are not effective enough to improve the five-year mean survival rate more than 10%. So research is going on to evaluate more effective way to treat this disease. In recent years, photothermal therapy grabbed the attention of scientific community, which uses the light energy to heat up a photosensitive material that would cause thermal damage to the cancer tissue. But this process has limitations. It affects not only the cancer tissue, but also the healthy surrounding tissue. To uh, overcome this limitation, we propose to utilize a specially designed gold nanoparticle uh, that would specifically target the cancer tissue only, uh, meaning that it would cause thermal damage to the cancer region, not the whole pancreas. This process required a needle-like device that would penetrate the soft tissue and transmit the high power laser energy and gold nanoparticle solution to the targeted area. After months of research, we came up with this idea of developing a fiber optic microneedle device that utilizes a specially designed uh, silica-based light guiding capillary fiber that can transfer the gold nanoparticle solution through the hollow bore. And at the same time, it can transmit high power laser energy through the annular silica cladding layer. We did some engineering to make this device fully functional and carried out the characterization test. We also proposed to utilize the existing endoscopic ultrasound device, which is widely used in the hospital uh, to acoustically visualize the pancreas tissue. This device has a hollow bore or a working channel that can be used to slide down the fiber optic microneedle device to reach the distant pancreas tissue. So our proposed minimally invasive treatment methods does not require any complicated surgery. It can save hundreds of lives, especially the elderly people who cannot survive the complicated surgery or chemotherapy. With that, I would like to conclude my talk here. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Farhad. We'll give our judges a couple minutes to enter their scores. Next up, we have Thurindu Atapatu from Electrical and Com Computer Engineering. And Thurindu, I'll let you know when you're ready to go. I, uh, can I start now? Uh, just one moment.
Okay, go ahead. Have you ever used a, a face ID on your phone or a fingerprint ID on your laptop? I guess most of you have. Biometric information have been used uh, for decades to recognize and authenticate people. So my research is uh, focused on this area. I'm using uh, face images and fingerprint images to recognize and authenticate people. So uh, these uh, faces and fingerprints have special points, which you call uh, key points. So if I be more specific about my research, what I'm uh, doing is I'm capturing these uh, key points from the images and uh, I calculate the distances and the ratios of distances and perform biometric fusion to come up with a new mechanism to recognize people. So yeah, this area has, uh, hasn't been studied adequately in my understanding. So the, uh, the goal of this research is to uh, improve the uh, Accuracy or recognition accuracy of a person um, by reducing the number of uh, mismatches. There are many advantages of this kind of approach. For example, uh, we don't use the, uh, the full images, so the uh, the results can be given very fast and uh, the computational power is very slow the computational power is very computational power required is very low and uh, the the storage it is very uh, the computational storage needed is very low so and also even in a security breach, this is very advantageous uh, because the, the hackers will not get the access to uh, the full images of the person. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, that's all from me. Thank you, Thurindu. Next up, we'll have Krista Berlin from Chemistry. <clears throat> Hi, Krista. I'll let you know when, it's, when you're ready to go. OK. Thank you. Sure. Um, I don't know if you saw the chat, but someone was asking if you could turn off that sound for the beeping when people come in and out. Yeah, I was looking at that. And I know um, Tracy had put some information in the chat to me, but I can't find it with, okay. yeah, I can't find it. I don't know how to turn it off either, so. <laughs>
Okay, Krista, you are good to go. Okay. It was just a month past my 30th birthday when I began feeling pain and experiencing this blurriness in my right eye. Now, for the record, I don't wear glasses or contacts. I've never had any eye issues. And as the pain got worse, I had to take time off of a new job to go see a doctor. After a series of exams, I was diagnosed with optical neuritis and the doctor wanted to send me to the emergency room for MRIs. How could that be? I'm a healthy person. I work out regularly. I take good care of myself. I eat well. No doubt I was skeptical of the doctor's diagnosis and ER recommendation, but I went along with it. Well, four days in the hospital, three rounds of steroid infusions, two MRI sessions and a spinal tap later, and I was officially diagnosed with multiple sclerosis or MS at only 30. You see, MS is one of the most commonly diagnosed uh, degenerative brain diseases in young adults. It affects women three times more than men, and currently it has no cure. Since being diagnosed, I've been on four different treatments, three involving injections, some with horrible side effects, and my MS is still not under control. With over 2.5 million people worldwide, the MS community is in need of new molecular drug targets. But where do we look? Well, how about within one of the hallmarks of MS, demyelination? You see, the brain is made of a fat, really important protective fat that we call myelin. And MS uses the body's own defense, its immune system to break down that myelin. So my brain is literally being broken down by the body it controls. But what if we could identify the molecular players within that demyelination process? We could potentially identify new molecular drug targets. Entrin Maldi-Toff IMS, or matrix-assisted laser desorption, ionization, time of flight, imaging, mass spectrometry. Oh, say that two times fast. This amazing analytical chemistry application can image the fat molecules we call lipids within an intact brain tissue section, generating mass maps that you see at the top of your screen. Molitoff IMS allows us to visualize the spatial distribution, co-localization and relative abundance of lipids involved in that demyelination process. So we can correlate molecular distribution to anatomical morphology. Each image you see above represents the molecular distribution of a different lipid. Now, because MS tissue can only be studied postmortem, an animal model of experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, or EAE, is, is employed because it represents the approximation of demyelination. Generating these mass maps will aid in the identification of new molecular drug targets. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. I was so terrified to go over. You did great. Thank you. Next, we have Vanessa Serta from Cell and Molecular Biology. She's actually in neurobiology, just to correct that. Thank you. Vanessa, are you here? Yes, I'm ready whenever you are. Yeah, can you turn on your camera? Yes. I have Perfect. it on. All right. So my name is Vanessa, and I'm going to start by asking you to think about a young kid around 10 years old. Okay, and now imagine that at home, this kid's parents only speak Spanish. So this was his first and only language until he started school. And in school, he was enrolled in English as a second language or ESL and continued to be in a dual language environment up until now. 
And so at least here in the US, children begin to learn simple arithmetic facts like multiplication very early in school. And I'm sure you all remember rehearsing and rehearsing these multiplication facts until they were overlearned expressions in your memory. And so because this kid was in ESL and in dual language classes, he only learned his multiplication facts in Spanish. And he even says that he prefers to do math primarily in Spanish. And this is pretty common for bilinguals to confidently state that they can only perform math in one of their languages. And in fact, a lot of previous research on bilingual arithmetic has shown that bilinguals are faster and they perform better in the language that they learned math compared to their other language. But let me point out that all of the state required assessments, including the STAR and all of the benchmarks are administered primarily in English. So this means that this kid is being tested in his weaker language for arithmetic. And because of this, he might be at a disadvantage compared to his bilingual peers who learned math and English or other classmates who only speak English. And this has been the reality for a lot of kids, including my parents and people that I grew up with and even kids that are in school now. So my research aims to understand what is going on in bilingual brains that causes them to have an advantage in one language over the other for math. And the way that I investigate this is I invite third through fifth grade children to come into our lab and play a simple multiplication game while I record their brain waves or brain activity. And so we use this fitted cap embedded with wires or electrodes um, that records continuous brain activity from the surface of the head. And so here I'm showing a little snapshot of what brain activity looks like over time in the rainbow colored lines. And so while we're recording these, while we record this activity, the kids will play a multiplication game in both English, where they have to solve problems like two times four, and Spanish, uh, where they solve problems like dos por cuatro. And so the really cool thing about the technique that I use is I can see changes in brain activity at a millisecond by millisecond basis. And I can compare brain activity at specific moments in time when they're playing this game in English versus Spanish. And I can try to understand what kind of processes children are using when they're performing math. And particularly, I'm looking for delays in brain activity or peaks in the brain data that might mean that they're using more effort in one language over the other. And so my findings will serve as valuable information for educators and people who create interventions for classrooms because I'm measuring direct brain activity. And our hope is that the kids like the one that I gave in my example would benefit from this research in the long term and eventually might be able to maintain both languages without having to struggle in either of their languages. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. We're gonna take a short five minute break so I can see if I can go in and, and get the all the chimes turned off. John, I was able to turn it off. So it's all set. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Tracy. The only thing you're gonna have to do is watch the waiting room because now you won't hear when people arrive, you'll just see it. Yeah, I always get a lovely window pop up. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, we have Hang Dang from Chemistry. So can I start? Uh, just one moment, okay? Okay, sure. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay. The first major outbreak of a coronavirus was nearly two decades ago. It was in China and quickly spread to 28 other countries. After the dust had settled on the original SARS outbreak, in 2012, a new strain of the coronavirus appeared in the Middle East, causing a similar spectrum of disease symptoms. Last year, we found another novel coronavirus outbreak and unavoidably became a global challenge. COVID-19 pandemic. What is it about the COVID-19 that makes it so hard to find a vaccine? COVID-19 are spherical and have proteins called spikes protruding from their surface. 
despite protein acts as grappling hooks that allow the virus to latch onto host cells and crack them open for infections. Hence, the main focus is to find a compound that can bind to the spike of the virus to prevent the replication. Imagine it's like the police handcuff you, so you cannot move, so you cannot do any criminal things. The question is, how do we find the police in this case to shackle the criminal COVID-19 virus? This, this is where my research comes into play. Anhydrocyclic compounds, the bottom left picture, immediately caught our attention since they are broadly represented among antiviral agents. So we modeled the COVID-19 spice proteins in the anhydrocyclic compounds. Then we simulated and calculated which compounds have the best binding interactions with the virus spikes. So we used empirical energy score thresholds. We selected 58 compounds out of 112 to further discuss their predicted interaction with the virus protein. We found that most favorable predictions were obtained for relatively large molecules containing substituents capable of accommodating in three or more subsides with the virus active site. For example, the n cyclic molecules that contain bromo, phenol, or naphthalene substituents had the best binding interaction with the spice proteins. Although none of the chosen compounds made it to clinical trials, we hope that this work contributes to the efforts of the scientific community in the fight against COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. Next up, we have Corey Davis from Electrical and Computer Engineering. Hey, Corey. Are okay. you ready? Are you ready? Uh, yeah. Can y'all see me too? Yes. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, you're good to go whenever you're ready. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Corey Davis, and the research that is low power encryption. Um, <clears throat> So pacemaker is used to regulate uh, the heart rate of, of a patient, typically in someone uh, that has uh, various arrhythmias that allows it's preventing their heart from even. So over the years, pacemakers have continuously improved their functionality, including adding the capabilities of wireless technology. And so this allows the doctors to access their uh, their, the patient's pacemaker to get uh, data from how the heart's working or to reprogram it. Now, since this data is sent over Wi Fi or any wireless network, yeah. so this increases the chances that this data could be intercepted or someone could transmit data to the pacemaker, uh, leading to some very unfriendly outcomes for the patient. Uh, in fact, uh, Abbott Medical called about 450,000 pacemakers because of the, uh, uh, some insecurities that exist. Um, Dick Cheney, they are for fear of potential terrorists doing doing something to them. Um, 
Now, as the technology has grown, these pacemakers have also gotten smaller. You see in the top right, some of these pacemakers are smaller than three centimeters long. So this accentuates the need for, for functionality that's smaller in area and smaller in, in power consumption. Um, <clears throat> so we came up with a design that compares very favorably to other recent uh, uh, state-of-the-art designs. Um, with the additional functionality of ours actually includes both encryption and decryption. The encryption to um, you know, data needs to be encrypted upon sending and then receiving views. So we have similar power, but extra functionality can be the others. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Next up, we have Prateek Gopala Krishnan from Electrical Hi. Computer Engineering. Hi, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'll let you know when you're ready to go, okay? Okay. Okay, whenever you're ready to start. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I have been an ardent user of so many smartphones since my childhood. But in 2016, when I came across a news article where it said one of the top smartphone battery exploded without any reason, I started becoming paranoid. I was like, what? Then I started reading more about it and concluded that the reason behind this is a material called lithium, which is used in our smartphones nowadays. This material also produces toxic gases like carbon monoxide when overheated. Consider this happening in a small seal environment like your new Tesla car. It will be devastating, right? That is when I started researching about alternatives to this problem. And now in 2021, I helped in developing a graphene supercapacitor that will never explode in any given condition. But where do we get the graphene from? Interesting question. It is quite simple. We have the answer for this in the tip of our pencils, which is a material called graphite from figure three. We simply have to use a scotch tape and press it against this graphite and release it. There you go. We have the best graphene thin film. But is it the best way? No, the process actually can be very tedious. During my research, I found out an even better way, which is more economical, of course. Here we basically have to powder the graphite which is very readily available around us and pass some oxygen onto it. We get graphene oxide. Then by sending in some chemicals into it, such as sodium hydroxide, we get graphene thin film, which is shown in figure four. So to conclude, you'll be asking me, why else do you have to use this graphene and graphene supercapacitors? We basically have three main advantages to it. Number one, its energy storage is similar to that of a normal battery. Number two, it is very fast. It can charge all our smartphones in like a few seconds. Number three, it is very long lasting, which is 100 times better than a normal battery. This is a brief history of my PhD research. And my name is Prateek Gobalishan. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Prateek. Next up, we have Johanna Jacob from Computer Science. Yes, can you hear and see me? I can, and I'll let you know when you're ready to go, okay? Okay.
Okay, Johanna, whenever you're ready. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Cybersecurity is a rapidly and a critical growing avenue in which the demand for jobs is constantly surging. A global survey points out that 2,300 security managers report that 59% of the organization's positions are vacant, although there is an 80% risk to the organization's infrastructure. And so in this regard, facilitating K-12 cybersecurity education plays a strategic role in countering the shortage as well as providing students with the platform they need to pursue pathways in cybersecurity. Albeit, there is a high and rising inequality in the United States, and that's the most pressing economic issue. And this equality would not be of great concern if the education system across the nation compensated for these disparities. This disparity leads to the creation of what we call as cybersecurity deserts. Cybersecurity deserts are zones where, the where there is a significant disparity of access to programs and opportunities in cybersecurity education. And this skill gap poses implications for knowledgeable cyber safe practices and hinders interest in students to take up computer science or STEM courses in general. And so the key research goal was to identify and understand these disparities in access to cybersecurity resources. And so in order to do that, I collaborated with Cyber Patriot. Cyber Patriot is a national youth cyber education program created by the Air Force Association to inspire K-12 students towards careers in security. And so at the core of the program is the National Youth Cyber Defense Competition, the nation's largest cyber defense competition that puts high school and middle school students through securing virtual networks. There were around 4,600 schools that participated in the 2020-2021 competition. Using quantitative analytic methods, we visualized the data and made some high level observations. There was a high representation accounting to more than 40% of non-Title I schools from some states. And to say these states have established solid cybersecurity career pathways initiated through middle school, high school, and statewide programs. And these states were also significant economic contributors and exhibit presence of cybersecurity companies in their communities. However, the representation of Title I schools in these states and in states that are just expanding their research showed a very slim participation ranging between zero to less than 5%. And so the results of the analysis helped understand that cybersecurity education resources are not consistent across educational settings and communities. Students who live in small and high poverty districts tend to be less exposed to educational opportunities. And so the results also suggested us that relatively privileged students who are not part of the economically disadvantaged schools may have more opportunities to be exposed to the field. And so to further this research, we have launched an official study with cyber patriots to understand the cybersecurity deserts and the factors that contribute that will help increase participation from Title I schools and help students align with appropriate resources in their communities. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Next up, we have Robin Johnson from English. Robin, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, wonderful. I'll let you know when you're ready to go. Okay, thank you. Okay, Robin, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. It is likely surprising to hear that in 2017, more Americans died from drug overdoses than in car crashes. This statistic is from the Office of National Drug Control Policy, which also estimates that nearly 89% of people who need treatment for substance use don't receive it due to the stigma of addiction. The office found that when treating a patient with an addiction, even highly trained medical experts will more likely to assign blame and believe that the patient should receive punitive measures rather than potentially life-saving therapeutic measures. 
I wanted to understand how the stigma of addiction can be challenged, finding that close readings of literature can foster narrative medicine, which was defined in 2001 by Rita Charon as the medicine infused with respect for the narrative dimensions of illness and caregiving. One way to achieve narrative medicine is through metaphor. Metaphors are powerful because they compare an indescribable experience, such as an addiction, to a knowledgeable one, which acts as a part of the necessary component of narrative medicine and understanding and respecting the, the plights of patients, including those with an addiction. I analyzed Natalie Diaz's poetry collection when my brother was an Aztec and applied how the use of godlike and war metaphors challenged the stigma of addiction by conceptualizing the illness as complex and multifaceted. In the title poem, The Brother Who Has an Addiction is presented as a metaphor for the Aztec god Hutzapole, a significant myth in Aztec culture known as the god of war. The poem metaphorically illustrates the magnitude that can, can characterize addiction in the form of one of the Aztec's most powerful gods. Readers can begin to imagine that the Aztec god of war, now a metaphor for the addiction, is difficult to conquer. The poem The Elephants contains a war metaphor to describe the brother's PTSD, which rages like hot green elephants. The use of this war metaphor allows readers to conceptualize that the brother's trauma from military service leaves him defenseless to combat the destructive elephants of trauma without the coping mechanism of his addiction. The brother shown through these metaphors provides a humanistic perspective of the experience with addiction. By turning to literature such as Diaz's, the narrative medicine of addiction is conceptualized away from the stigma and instead towards empathy and can lead to potentially life-saving treatment. The blame is no longer on the brother, but on the substance, which becomes a powerful Aztec god and a coping, mechan coping mechanism for war's angry elephants. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Hey, we're going to take a short, um, just five minute break, and I will be placing the People's Choice Survey link into the chat momentarily.
Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started or back started. Uh, next up, we have Mutaki Kamal from Anthropology. Uh, do you guys see and hear me? Yep, I can see and hear you. And I'll let you know when you're ready to go, okay? Okay. Okay, whenever you're ready. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mutaki. And if you are looking for a crazy person who lurks in the bushes and talks to the plants, I'm your guy. So why and how do I communicate or talk to the plants? The answer to the why is very simple. We cannot imagine our lives without plants. From oxygen to plants, everything comes from plants. Moreover, being able to communicate with plants will allow us to solve agricultural and ecological problems that we are having these days. And for the how part, fortunately, I'm not alone. Throughout the history, people have been trying to communicate with plants, especially indigenous people, such as the Rajbongshi tribe of the tea garden workers in Bangladesh have communicative rituals towards plants. Moreover, their relentless deep ecological Observations claim that these communications influence physical and behavioral changes in plants. Thus, in my field study, I will become an apprentice to the medicine man of this tribe and learn their communicative techniques. These techniques involve touching them, blowing smoke to them, or chanting towards them. Next, what I will do is I will take this device to the plants. These devices are called sensors or spiker box. This particular one that I showed you came from a European organization called Phyto Science. And this device is able to measure the electric signals from plants. What are these electric signals? Just as we do, plants communicate within their body through electric signals, which are called action potentials. Measuring these action potentials at the right time and analyzing them through rigorous mathematical models as Markov chains give us the chance to determine the future uh, physical and behavioral changes in plants. This method is so precise that in February this year, researchers Daniel Tran and Cedric Camps detected iron deficiency in commercial tomato plants eight days before the occurrence. So this study will allow me to learn about the physical changes as growth, germination, flowering, etc., and behavioral changes as movements in plants due to human plant interactions. So this is how your crazy plant guy talks to the plants. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mutagi. Appreciate that. Next up, we have Asad Ali Khan from Electrical and Computer Engineering. Hi. Can you hear and see my video, Joe? We can see you and we can hear you. Yes. I'll let you know when you're ready to go, okay? Thank you. John? Yes. Would I be able to ask a housekeeping question? Sure. So I see Assad, who is in my score sheet as number 10, and he's right after Robin Johnson. So where was our previous speaker? Um, let me look at the team. I see him as number 16. Number 16? OK, thank you. Uh, thank you. That was good. I thank you.
Okay, Assad, whenever you're ready. The U.S. Energy Information Administration projects that the share of renewables in the U.S. electric city generation mix will increase from 21% in 2020 to 42% in 2050. One of the most effective ways to integrate this renewable energy into power network is using distributed control architecture. Distributed generation, DG, refers to various technologies that generate electricity at or near where it will be used, such as solar panels. The use of DG units in the US has increased for a variety of reasons, such as renewable technologies have become more cost effective. Several states and local governments are advancing policies to encourage the use of renewables. Smart microgrids are power electronics based cyber physical systems having an extensive communication layer for information sharing among power generators, control centers, and loads. The presence of communication layers makes such a system vulnerable to cyber physical attack. The most common type of cyber attack is false data injection, where an adversary tries to manipulate the sensor readings, control signals, and desired set reference points. This may lead to the loss of synchronization between generation units and may destabilize the power operation. The slice bottom right image is a beautiful picture of the Dallas skyline taken from the reunion tower. Recently, about 46,000 megawatts of power, enough to provide electric city to 9 million homes were taken off the grid due to power generation failures stemming from winter storms. These events were not a direct result of some external attack, but an event that has happened due to some unintentional reason may be reproduced intentionally. Therefore, the presence of anomaly identification and mitigation system is critical to uninterrupted power system operation. And that is where my research is focused on. As shown in the top left of the slide, I am I'm applying the data-driven artificial intelligence techniques in distributed cooperative control-based microgrids for timely detection of the cyber physical attacks. For this purpose, a microgrid is simulated and various normal and attack cases are considered to generate enough data for the training of AI models. One of the challenges is to extract optimal features from the generated data for the training of the AI models. The attack identification system shares the alert signal with the system's operator when under attack condition. After identification, the next part of the research work will target these attacks mitigation by coming up with a resilient control mechanism. That will be achieved by using trained AI models in the control loops. This research work will help to increase the resiliency of the microgrids and reliable power supply. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asad. Next up, we have Syed Sasan Kedmat Gazar Dalati from Civil Engineering. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you and we can see you. I'll let you know when you're ready to go, okay? Okay. whenever you're ready to start. Okay. Do you feel safe in your building? Buildings can be loaded in two direction, vertical direction and horizontal direction. Vertical direction represent the load for a snow load, for the dead weight of the member, for the people that are living, as you can see in the second picture. And the horizontal is representing for wind load or earthquake. I'm going to talk more about that because it's gonna cause problem. In the third picture, you can see the collapsed building picture. Building will collapse if column collapse. But what's going to cause that column collapse? At the beginning, we have to find the reason for column failure. These are some special terms in civil engineering, like 
peer failure, anchorage failure, that professors and engineers are making the model of them in their lab, as you can see in the middle row, the second picture, um, and, and doing many experimental tests and applying the earthquake load on the, on the column to find what is the problem. Concrete is the problem, steel is a problem. And after finding, they improve the material and they say, okay, the column can have more squeak and it's gonna not fail in the future. But the problem is here that they are considering only three cycle or one cycle for earthquake, but the earthquake cycles is not known. It, had, it can have more numbers. In the other word, they are considering that only earthquake push the column or building three times or one times in each displacement in both sides. So how can we solve the problem? See that maybe uh, increasing those cycle will affect the column failure. We model them in the Athena, which is the software for nonlinear finite element, and we apply different cycles to see the effect. In the middle row, in the right picture, you can see the comparison between Athena and experimental, that we can trust the software or not. We can see that those diagrams are exactly matches each other, and so this result is trustable. We can increase the cycles to see that what is the effect. In the third row, in the first picture, we are comparing three different cyclic loading to one column with the same material. The one that does not have any cyclic load, the blue diagram, which representing the first picture, is the column that can take 170 millimeter without failing. If, we, if earthquake push column three times per displacement in both sides, the green one, which is gonna be the second column, it's going to be 130 millimeter. And if the earthquake push six times, it's gonna to take for 100 millimeter. So column failure is affected directly by the number of cycles and engineer and professors have to consider that for making the number of the cycles. Even with this software, we are able to predict crack pattern. I'm sure that all of us want to not have any crack in our building. Even we are able to find the reinforcement yielding. It means which part of the seal are going to have problem. By this software, we are going to prevent column failure and building failure. Thank you. Asma Mansour from English. Asma, are you ready? I'm just wondering if you have used, uh, if you have seen the uh, the message that I've just sent yeah, you. Yeah, I can't, I can't change it at this time, so we'll have to use the slide you submitted. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, go ahead. Hi, everybody. My research is entitled Toward a Chicana Decolonial Reading of Autobiographical Writings by Egyptian Women since the 1950s to, to present. It examines autobiographical writings by Zainab Al Ghazali, Latif Al Zayat, Nawali Sadawi, and Badwa Shur. Specifically, my research analyzes these writings through a Chicana feminist and narrative decolonial theories, a new approach that establishes solidarity between Arab women and Chicanas and emphasizes that Arab women are women of color. I use Chicana feminist theories, namely decolonial love, conocimiento, and spiritual activism because they are more intersectional than Arab feminism and Islamic feminism, and because Arab feminism and Islamic feminism, though very promising, still need to be developed and expand to include race, ethnicity, sexuality, spirituality, coalition building, and spiritual activism. I use Chicana narrative theory, namely autohistoria, because there is a complete lack of theorization of Arab women autobiography as a genre. Now our goal is reading Arab women's autobiographies. Shahrazad tells her story is the only book that exists today that attempts to theorize Arab women's autobiographies since the book's publication in 2003. 
Goli suggests what might be called the Shahrazad narrative as a theory to analyze these writings. However, I refrain from using Shahrazad as it automatically insinuates Oriental views on Arab women, even if we try to subvert or rewrite Shahrazad's story. Moreover, unlike Goli, I do not attempt to argue that Arab women autobiographers write back to Westerners or Arab males, but rather write forward to a future yet to be realized. I define the decolonial in this research as an ongoing process of defying coloniality as a theory uh, that defies Western hegemony, imperialism, knowledge production, and dismantles the binaries it produces. Through deploying Chicana decolonial theories, I argue that Egyptian women writers decolonize themselves and their communities, reclaim their presence in colonial history and politics, reinterpret ancient Egyptian mythology, use Islamic spirituality to transcend the physical and political oppressions and cross the borders between facts and fictions. My findings are Chicana feminists, Arab feminists, and Islamic feminists share common struggles. Chicana feminists are accused of borrowing from white feminism, and Arab feminisms and Islamic feminisms are deemed as Western products irrelevant to Arab women and Muslim women. Between the two revolutions in 1952 and 2011, up till today, little seems to have changed in terms of political repression and the living condition of Egyptian women. Egypt has been ruled by a military state that is no different from coloniality and imperialism. Some of my contributions are opening Arabic studies to decolonial approaches and shifting from Eurocentric theories that have dominated the study of Arabic autobiography and from post-colonial theories by Said, Spivak, and Baba. Contributing to theorizing Islamic feminism, I believe that confining the debate till today to the compatibility or the incompatibility of, fem of feminism to Islam is a colonial discourse. And finally, moving away from hegemonic comparisons in academia between Arab women and Victorian or French feminists, and instead uh, turning the wheel to Arab and women of color comparisons. So thank you. Marina Meyer Acosta from Neurobiology. Asma, if you can turn off your camera, please. Thank you. Karina, are you ready? Yes. Okay, I'll let you know when you're good to go. Okay, whenever you're ready. Three years after my grandma was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I did 23andMe and discovered I was a carrier of the leading genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's, ApoE4. It was a macabre serendipity because a few weeks before knowing my ApoE status, I decided I wanted to dedicate my research into this exact genetic risk factor, ApoE4. However, I'm not alone. What if I were to tell you that one of three people are carriers of ApoE4? Why is it that some people with ApoE4 get Alzheimer's and some don't? We still don't know because Alzheimer's develops over decades prior to cognitive decline and studying human brain tissue from Alzheimer's patients only provides us with a snapshot of the aftermath, but not the causes. The struggle lies with finding a model to actually study how Alzheimer's takes roots in the, in the human brain. I say human because mice do not develop Alzheimer's so they don't make the best model either. So I wanna share how we can make mini brains from patients with Alzheimer's to study disease development. What we can do is take skin or blood cells from Alzheimer's patients or healthy individuals, and using tiny molecules, we can reprogram these cells into pluripotent stem cells, which can become any cell in the body. And we're interested in the brain, so using small molecules that mimic brain development, we can make mini brain organoids, which maintain several properties of human brain tissue, making them a valuable tool to study early features of disease development. In my case, I can take patient samples from Alzheimer's risk variant ApoE4, patients and I turn them into mini brains to look at what is happening to the cells before Alzheimer's take root and before the damage has even started. 
the mini brains have identified specific neurons that are vulnerable to ApoE4, and the loss of these neurons might be the initial event that causes Alzheimer's disease to take root in the brain. The hope is to one day understand what exactly does ApoE4 do to the brain to make neurons vulnerable to damage? Are there environmental triggers or is there something we can do to prevent neurons from dying? Are there therapeutics we can make to prevent Alzheimer's? The biggest reason why every single Alzheimer's drug has failed in clinical trials is that we are targeting the consequence instead of the cause of Alzheimer's. Understanding how ApoE4 makes the brain vulnerable will help us understand the causes of Alzheimer's disease so we can target the brain before vulnerability becomes dementia. My grandma is 96 years old and despite losing interest in most of the things that she loves, she asks my dad about me and my education every time they talk. With models like these mini brain organoids, I think the future is promising for my fellow ApoE4 carriers. I'm Karina Meyer Costa and thank you for listening. Thank you, Karina. Next, we have Alejandro Morales Betancourt from Physics and Astronomy. Hi, Alejandro. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you and can see you. I'll let you know when it's when you're good to go, okay? Okay. whenever you're ready. Uh, good morning. Probably you have heard about aggressive treatments to contain or reduce the size of tumor like chemo and radiotherapy. Personally, I have witnessed how my father-in-law has suffered not once but twice due to aggressive therapies to save his life by reducing his quality. These adverse effects are to the need of overcoming a stress resistance developed by cancer cells due to modify the toxification pathways. In other words, cancer cells protect themselves from external entities, including anti-cancer therapies, which in healthy conditions would activate cleaning processes resulting in the programmed death of those cells. The decontamination activity is highly regulated by a molecule called glutathione that controls the balance of reactive oxygen species or ROS within the cell. Glutathione interacts with the active site of molecules called selenocysteines with our amino acids produced when selenium is available. Increased interactions between glutathione and selenium reduces the drug resistance ability of cancer cells because it consumes glutathione generated uh, by ROS. But when there is no selenium available, sulfur replace uh, this selenium uh, in the active sites, introducing a different amino acid called cysteine that have limited reactivity with glutathione. Our approach is to take advantage of this substitution process and introduce a material that reacts better with, with uh, glutathione. Tellurium belongs to the same family of sulfur and selenium, and it's able to form active sites in the form of, of tellurocysteines. While this molecule does not occur naturally, synthetic forms have uh, uh, high reactivity with glutathione and in fungi and bacterial models. Tellurium compounds have been used as cancer co-treatment, but the toxic effects of pure tellurium in human cells are not completely understood. Our group is producing a selenium, a selenium tellurium nano alloy and tested in vitro with cancer cell cultures to in, uh, investigate re the response of the cleaning process uh, to the introduction of nano entities with different ratios of selenium and tellurium. That better uh, can trigger the substitution of selenium by tellurium in their active sites. So in summary, the natural choice of cells in, uh, is selenium represented here by a blue tag, but in the absence uh, the cells will replace it by sulfur, the, the red tag. If we introduce the tellurium yellow tag, the cell will not accept it because of its toxicity. But if we disguise it as uh, selenium telluride by color blue yellow tag, we could combine the low toxic effects of selenium with high tellurium glutathione reactivity. The use of these materials would potentially lead to low glutathione, high ROS, and cause a weakened uh, drug resistance. Use it as co-treatment, this would translate into limited collateral damage by cancer treatments. Thank you very much.
have Mohammed Nadim from Electrical and Computer Engineering. Yeah, uh, I hope you can see and hear me. I can hear and see you. Uh, you're good, and I'll let you know when you're ready to go, okay? Okay. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay. When you hear the term human machine interactive system or chatbots, what comes in your mind? Yes, a chatbot is a computer program designed to simulate conversation with human user via text message or speech. And it can provide services to human user to gain a well-defined result. According to the Business Insider report, the chatbot market in 2024 is estimated to be around $10 billion which is four times bigger than in 2019. Uh, the growth is incredible. The virtual assistants like Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant are good examples for chatbot. You can schedule your doctor's appointment, order and purchase items. You can do monetary transactions and so on. They are making our lives easier, isn't it? What if I say they are vulnerable to cyber attacks and it can make your life miserable? Yes, that is correct. Imagine a scenario where you are talking with a banking chatbot and doing some transactions or inquiring some information. The cyber criminals can exploit the chatbot vulnerabilities to hijack your information. Not only hijacking the information, but the cyber criminals can also pretend to be you and fool the chatbot if the chatbot is not secure. Myself, Mohammed Nadim, I am from electrical and computer engineering department, and my research is focused on advancing and securing human machine interactive system. I have chosen the kernel level rootkit, a special type of uh, malware to exploit the vulnerabilities of chatbot uh, so we can secure them. Now, what is a rootkit? A rootkit is a special type of malware designed to enable access uh, to computer resources that is not otherwise allowed or without the consent of the user. The kernel level rootkit targets the operating system kernel, which is the most privileged part of an operating system. By the term privileged means, the highest control to access the resources of a computer system. The kernel level rootkit can even hijack or subvert your security software. You may think you have the security software installed in your computer while the cyber criminals are remotely controlling your computer using the rootkit. A perfect example of how dangerous a rootkit can be is Spanek. Uh, if you heard it caused substantial damage to the nuclear facilities of Iran and they were forced to stop the nuclear facility. My research is to use kernel level rootkit uh, to exploit the chatbot vulnerabilities and see the impact of such attacks. Uh, thank you all for listening to my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions in mind, please feel free to contact me later. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Next, we have Reed Nolan from Electrical and Computer Engineering. Hi. Reith, is your camera on? Oh, yes, my camera's on. Can you not see it? Oh, now I can see you, yeah. Okay, whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. My name is Reith Nolan. Uh, as of today, EV, uh, EV cars and systems are becoming more and more prevalent with the rise of Tesla and Ford, Canoe, and other companies uh, trying to offset carbon emissions. 
Uh, all these new systems require charging systems uh, to charge the batteries inside of them, uh, which leads to huge security risks because there's a lot of communication that goes on these. Uh, cars these days, most of them use what's called a CAN bus network, which is a broadcast network, uh, which every single node on the system can communicate with one another by either broadcasting messages or they all receive the same message. And in the system, uh, the lowest node levels or addresses uh, take priority to prevent contention. So one of the concerns is a malicious actor being able to get access to one of these systems, placing one of their nodes on this CAN bus network, and they can inject uh, malicious code and whatnot into the system, uh, which is a huge secure security concern as we move forward and develop more of these. Uh, so the goal of my project is to develop an AI system which can sit on the network and monitor all the messages passing through it. It would be placed at the lowest level or one of the lowest levels on the CAN bus network at a lower address, uh, giving it priority for messaging. And what it does is it sits there and determines whether each of the messages passing on the CAN bus network is a normal message or if there is malicious attacks going on, be it a man in the middle attack, uh, attempting to crash the system uh, with an overload of messages, uh, adjusting these systems um, that are going on, uh, the measurement systems for voltage, current, thermals uh, that the charger is taking measurements of um, as it's charging the battery. Now, the, the overall goal of this then is to take this and pass it into a deep neural net uh, shown on my slide, which will then classify all of these messages into classification such as normal, this is this attack, and also provide uh, guidance on the threat level, whether this is something minor, severe, um, and then also provide that information for each of these classification levels to a handler, which can take decisive action to either correct, uh, correct the error by sending a message on a higher priority node to reset the device, um, to either just log it if it's not a concern, if it doesn't affect the overall health or state um, or do nothing. It may not have to do anything at all. It may not require logging. It could just be a false, uh, a false positive uh, in this classification network. And uh, the big concern with all of this is to increase security on these networks, uh, especially in electric vehicles as we move into um, self-driving cars and, and self-controlling cars, um, because these networks can, can really uh, interfere with, with your vehicle. You can um, you can upset the charger, you can prevent thermal or create thermal issues, um, such as the battery stops charging or damaging batteries, um, damaging electronics and interfere with the vehicle itself um, through these charging systems. Uh, thank you for your time. have Carla Paniagua from Electrical and Computer Engineering. Hello. Uh, we can see you and we can hear you. I'll let you know when you're ready to go, okay? Okay, thank you. Whenever you're ready, Carla. Hello, I am Carla Paniagua, PhD student of electrical engineering. My research interest is in regulation and single cell analysis. Are enhancers RNA functional? This is the question that led me to start my research. But what are enhancers RNA? The human genome is composed of around 400,000 proteins, where close to 25,000 are gene coding proteins. The rest was believed to be useless, but it has been demonstrated that most of the human genome transcribes, and regions that do not transcribe regulate genes. Enhancers are cis acting elements that can increase the expression of target genes. They can, they can act as transcriptional units to produce enhancers RNAs, which are non coding RNA molecules involved in the regulation of gene expression, whose mechanisms of actions are poorly understood. Enhancers RNAs, imaged on top, are composed of two flanks non overlapping with a core. Cores function as regular enhancers, while flanks transcribe RNA proteins that can. Uh, regulate the, the expression of their target genes. They can also alter histone modifications to regulate transcriptional repression. 
um, recent studies show that enhancers RNA are present in several types of cancers. So there are therapeutic attempts to, that try to regulate enhancers RNA by silencing the RNA. I um, profile the characteristics of enhancers RNA to try to get an insight into their mechanisms of action. Data was obtained from the phantom and the NIH databases. So are enhancers RNA functional? To answer this question, first, the average of all signals was um, the average of all signals of the hepatogenome was overlapped with RNA binding proteins important in the hepatocellular carcinoma, an aggressive polytumor with poor prognosis and high mortality. So, plotted in the right, we can see three examples of RNA binding proteins that play an important role in hepatocellular carcinoma bind with enhancers RNA. For example, AO2 an RNA binding protein whose expression is altered in hepatocellular carcinoma, where we can see overrepresentation of the RNA binding proteins, especially on the flank, which provides evidence that we have, um, provides evidence that, we, that, that these um, flanks or these regions are functional. The next step was to um, Observe some functional cases with the eclipse technology that finds the RNA, the dividing sites of the RNA binding protein. On the left, we can observe two plots. On top, we have the enhancer with the core in red and the flanks in blue. The peaks are the RNA binding protein. We can see significant binding on the flanks where we see these big peaks. So, in conclusion, enhancers RNA are functional because they overlap important cancer proteins. We see significant binding on the flanks that transcribes and not in course that acts as regular enhancers. So the next step in this research is to get to know the mechanisms that affect the enhancer's RNA. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Next, we have Dimitrolis. Pantelis from Electrical and Computer Engineering. Dimitrilis, are you here? It does not look like he's in the room. So we're John, gonna... let's move on to the next person. Yes. Yeah. Next up, we have Daniel Portillo from Mechanical Engineering. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can see you, Daniel, whenever you're ready. Last year, only about a third of the 100,000 people on the wait list to receive a life-saving organ transplant actually received an organ. A large part of that organ shortage was caused by inadequate preservation devices. The current devices can only preserve a single organ, they're pretty complicated to use, and they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's those exact shortcomings that lead us to our central question. Can a single non-electronic device be created to preserve multiple organs? Additionally, can we make that device affordable and easy to use? The first thing we had to do was create the device itself, which you can see on the left side of the screen. Even though it's holding a pig kidney, this device actually has the capacity to store a human-sized kidney, liver, heart, or pancreas. The entire device operates on a single source of compressed oxygen, which is sent to the device and pulses through an electronic valve. Those oxygen pulses circulate the preservation solution just like our heart pumps our blood, and because of the pump design, the oxygen actually mixes into that preservation solution. This means that this device can deliver both nutrients and oxygen to an organ. The graphs in the middle show how the device performed when it was pumping against the resistance of a kidney and a heart. The blue data shows how the device behaved and the orange boxes show the desired ranges of behavior. Ultimately, 
Both graphs show that the device can match the flow rate and flow pressures used by previous groups. And you may be thinking, well, that's awesome, but didn't you just say you were using an electronic valve? And you'd be right, because we were, but that valve is only temporary. If you look at the right side of the screen, you can see a fluidic oscillator, which is a channel that turns a steady stream of flow into an oscillating stream of flow. And the incoming flow actually switches from side to side within the oscillator right about where that star is. The neat part is that if we direct that oscillating flow into two outlets, we actually get pulse flow exiting each of the outlets. And we believe that with the right fluidic oscillator design, that pulse flow could be used to drive the oxygen that's entering and operating the device. My team is currently evaluating different fluidic oscillators for this purpose in UTSA's Hypersonics Aerospace Lab and using UTSA's supercomputer Shamu. So to summarize, my team has created an innovative organ preservation device that is easy to use and relatively cheap. We have demonstrated that it can supply the flow rates and flow pressures used to preserve a variety of organs. And we are currently trying to make the operation even simpler by replacing the electronic component with a non-electronic fluidic oscillator. Ultimately, this device has the potential to save thousands of lives by pushing the envelope towards improved organ preservation methods. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Daniel. Next, we have Carolina Ramirez Tamayo from Advanced Manufacturing and Enterprise Engineering. Hello. I can hear you. Do you have your camera on? Um, yes. Can you see me? Um, I can't see you. No. There you are. Yes. Okay. I'll let you know when you're good to go, okay? Okay. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you very much. I'll set the time here. Okay, hello everybody. Have you ever imagined how challenging can be for a patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus to establish a healthy lifestyle? Type 2 diabetes mellitus is one of the most common chronic diseases among Americans. About one in 10 Americans have diabetes and approximately 90% of those have type 2 diabetes. So managing this condition can be for an experienced with a stable metabolism, taking the necessary control of their glucose level. But unfortunately, this is not a case for an inexperienced or elderly patient. Here is where our research takes place and the use of artificial intelligence through digital twins is proposed. Analyzing daily capture data from several patients in order to help patients and doctors to manage type 2 diabetes mellitus more efficiently. The main goal of the project is to make patients aware of best practices to manage the blood glucose level and give them a personalized plan that they can apply in their daily routine. Now, at this point, you may ask yourself how artificial intelligence takes place here. Well, first, as you can see in the slide, patient's behavior was modeled using digital twins. Digital twins can be defined as a digital representation of real life objects, living or non-living. In a healthcare setup, based on continuous tracking the health and lifestyle parameters, it is possible to build such as personalized models that can result in this case adaptation of a patient. With that in mind, the second step is about data collection. The data is collected from people's phone. The study included patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus who were overweight or obese and were diagnosed within the last six months. The collected lifestyle data includes history of diet, exercise, and weight. Then, after having all that historical data and given some past data, the team identified.
Caroline, are you there? Okay, we're gonna move forward judges. Um, we'll let Carolina, if she's able to, to connect, reconnect, um, we'll have her, we'll place her at the end and let her do, uh, do over. Technology fails us sometimes. Next, we'll have Adnan Shariar from Mechanical Engineering. Adnan, are you here? Adnan, I see you're in the I see you're in uh, the Zoom. Let's move to the next person where Adnan is dealing with technology. Okay. Bring him back at the end as well. Next up, we have Feng Tao, electrical and computer engineering. Hello, I'm back. Uh, yes, yeah, Carolina, sorry. we're going to put you at the end. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Bang, are you here? Yes, can you see me? Uh, I can, let's see. Yep. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm ready now. Okay, go ahead. So hi, uh, my name is Fan Tao. I'm a PhD candidate from the EC department. Today, I'm going to present my current work on inverse reinforcement learning, which is a subtopic in the artificial intelligence research area. Before introducing my work, I would like to briefly mention the terminology reinforcement learning, shorted as RL. RL is a research or training agent to make sequential decisions in an environment. The goal of RL is to maximize the community reward. Successful RL examples can be seen in the left images. Besides the application in gaming, RL can also be applied in other areas, such as robotics manipulation, safe driving cars, etc. One toy demo is shown in the middle. In this demo, the mouse has to make sequential decisions to eat as many cheesecakes as possible in a limit time. The learning process for the mouse can be formed as an RL, where the reward can be assigned proportional to the number of cheesecakes. If the mouse ends to a gray that does not have cheesecakes, the reward is zero. In most of the RL research, the reward function is assumed to be known. However, it is not true in practice. Therefore, how to assign a good reward function in, is both a necessary and interesting topic in the field of RL. And the task of interpreting the reward function is named as inverse reinforcement learning. Inverse reinforcement learning targets at quantifying actions based on expert demonstrations, assuming all actions are reasonable. The classical inverse reinforcement learning approach has an iterative structure as shown in the bottom right figure, which consists of three sequential steps. Step one, conduct RL given the current reward function. Step two, collect samples from the learned strategy and compare them with expert demonstrations. Step three, adjust the, the reward function following the idea that the expert should collect a larger community reward. The given structure works well in simple tasks but it is not a good option for complex problems. In particular, the RL process itself in large environment is time consuming. Hence, iteratively conducting the IL processes is definitely not efficient. Another challenge is that inverse reinforcement learning relies on the underlying principle that experts always perform better than the other ones. And the cases of non-optimal experts has, have not been considered yet. Therefore, I'm currently working on addressing these two challenges that is to make inverse reinforcement learning efficient in large environment and to enable the learned reward function lead to a exceeding strategy based on the non-optimal expert. Once these two problems are solved, we can have a smarter learning agent than the expert, which should be a milestone for the artificial intelligence. That's it, thank you. 
Thank you, Fang. Next, we have Jacqueline Williams from Cell and Molecular Biology. Jacqueline, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Perfect. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Good. I'll let you know when you're good to go, okay? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Today I'm going to talk to you about viruses that usually don't make the news. On the right, you see a plant that is infected with a virus called tomato golden mosaic virus. And on the left is a cabbage plant plant infected with cabbage leaf pearl viruses. This, these are part of a larger family of viruses called Gemini viruses. And in the middle is an electron micrograph of actual viral particles. Gemini viruses are responsible for millions of dollars of crop loss worldwide. Plants such as tomato, cassava, tomato, tomato cassava, beans, and uh, cassava. And cassava. Uh, this is especially devastating in areas and regions where, uh, in regions where, subsistence farming is a major form of crop production, and where knowledge and resources to manage these outbreaks are limited. The virus is, is transferred or transmitted to a plant by a vector such as a white fly. Once in the cell, the virus begins its replication cycle. Now, like most viruses, Gemini viruses rely on and reprogram host cell processes to create an environment that's favorable for viral replication. On my project, we are looking, at, we have identified host cell proteins that are needed for the virus to create this environment. One such protein is TCP24. So in experiments where we've had blocked interaction of TCP24 with the virus, we have observed that in the plant, the symptoms are delayed and you have fewer viral particles, newly formed viral particles in the replication cycle. And this is compared with uh, viruses where these interactions are allowed to occur. So it's important in under, to understand the molecular process of viral replication and to identify proteins that are needed, for the vi needed by the virus to create an environment favorable for replication and this knowledge will allow us to develop new strategies to prevent future outbreaks. Thank you. We have Chen Zhang from Applied Statistics. Hi. Hi, I'll let you know when you're ready, okay? Thank you. Okay, whenever you're ready. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Shen Zhang, and I'm a second year PhD student in applied statistics. Today, I'm going to show you our work on correlations. I believe that most of you know correlation more or less, right? So correlation is, uh, is used to describe the linear relationship between continuous variables. For example, the height and the weight it measures the strength and the direction of the linear relationship between two or more variables. And here is a positive relation example. And the more time you spend running on the treadmill, the more calories you will burn. 
uh, we are interested in the correlation because we can use it to deal with a lot of real world problems. We could use to uh, make prediction, to assess the validity of a measure, to study the product reliability and so on. And here is a common way to calculate the Pearson relationship between two variables. Uh, in that way, people estimate the correlation only by the data they got. And the larger sample size is, the more accurate estimated a correlation will be. But, but what if we want to add some information from our knowledge? And what if we cannot get enough observations? In our project, we propose a vision method to test if there exists a certain correlation between two variables. And one of the coolest things is that this method allows us to combine the information behind the data and our background knowledge. And with the Kindle's rank correlation and the prior information, we can get a value called base factor. And uh, if the base factor is greater than one, we will claim that there exists a certain correlation between these two variables. And otherwise, we would claim the certain correlation does not exist. Pretty easy, right? And in this way, we could get accurate results with much less data. And this method is more robust against outliers. Moreover, the, uh, the Kindle's rank correlation is pretty easy to calculate from the data. And that's what we did. Thank you for your time. John, while we're waiting, can I just add something? So we all know technology is an issue. So please do not panic if something goes wrong in your presentation, we'll just add you back at the end. So Carolina and Adnan, we will, oh, Carolina is already up. So no need to worry. Thank you. Hello. Hi, all right, all right. Uh, let's give the judges a few, uh, just a minute to enter their scores um, and then uh, we'll, we'll start over, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Sure, not a problem. Okay, you let me know. Yeah, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Have you ever imagined how challenging can be for a patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus to establish a healthy lifestyle? Well, type 2 diabetes mellitus is one of the most common types of chronic diseases among Americans. About one in 10 Americans have diabetes and approximately 90% of them have type 2 diabetes. So managing this condition can be easy for an experienced patient with a stable metabolism taking the necessary control of their glucose level. But unfortunately, this is not a case for an inexperienced or elderly patient. Here is where our research takes place and the use of artificial intelligence through digital twins is proposed analyzing its daily captured data from several patients in order to help patients and doctors to manage type 2 diabetes mellitus more efficiently. The main goal of the research is to make patients aware of best practices to manage their blood glucose level and give them a personalized plan that they can apply in their daily routine. Now, at this point, you may ask yourself how artificial intelligence takes place here. Let's see. First, as you can see in the slide, patient's behavior was modeled using digital twins. Digital twins can be defined as a digital replication of real life objects, living or non-living. In a healthcare setup, based on continuous tracking the health and lifestyle parameters, it is possible to build such personalized models that can result in a digital representation of, in this case, patients. With that in mind, the second step is about data collection. The data is collected from the individual's phone, and uh, then from the individual's phone, you can then use their diet, weight, and, and calories that they consume. After that, the model uh, alerts the user about possible uh, situations in the blood glucose level. 
The last step was validation, and then the model was built using neural networks. The neural networks identifies patterns in blood glucose level of patients based on their behavior. And having that pattern, the model was validated in a data set of some patients that were monitored daily for over six months. The results were pretty good. Uh, the proposed model uh, works with same accuracy, and we continue further improving this model to make it more efficiently. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, for our last presenter, we have Anand Shariar. Anand, are you here? Yes. Wonderful. I'll you. have you get started in just a minute. Is your kid, there you, there you are. We can see you and we can hear you. Great, thanks. Okay, I will have you get started in just a moment, okay? Okay, sure. Okay, so I start now. Yes, feel free to start. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, when I think about like your home or habitat, we always think of it as like a dead thing. For example, if you break the window of your home, uh, your home has no clue that something is wrong in it and the mechanic can fix it after a week. But if you have a habitat in the lunar environment or an extraterrestrial environment, you can't afford to do that because you have a bridge there the window is broken, you're probably going to die. And there's no mechanic to fix that either. So we think of those habitat as some sort of uh, brain, which you can see the big brain there. So, and also there is a meteoroid impact, which causes a hole, which is just below the brain, big brain. So the habitat actually knows that it's damaged and it asks for help. Uh, and basically the structure health monitoring will do this thing and send the data to the robotic or human agent to do the repair. So uh, the, these type of habitats are extremely complicated. To so designing such habitat is not an easy task. You can think of it as like a combination of multiple subsystems, like the organ of human body. And there are like structural subsystem, eclipse, robotic, human, a lot of them. So one way to design it is uh, to develop models for each of them and connect all of them together. So that's what basically we are doing. My job is specifically to the structural mechanical system and we uh, and what we have done to achieve uh, such, such this goal, we developed computational models. And for that, uh, the first thing we did is develop a computational platform, which you can see on the left-hand side, the bottom image. It gives a brief overview of the interconnected, how interconnected the system is. The big block is the structural mechanical model. It talks with all other subsystem around it. It takes the data, it determines the damage, it determines the repair, and it outputs the data as required. And the right-hand side is the numerical model to run, the, run the everything in real time. So this numerical model is reduced order. We use machine learning, and we also use our custom elements, or, or also like, um, I mean, uh, damage mechanics, all of them to replicate the structural mechanical behavior of the real habitat into the numerical and numerical sense. So, um, but this is also uh, updated by experimental model. The image at the bottom, you can see there is a red dot in the blue, blue globe, basically a blue dome. It represents the same damage as you can see in the uh, top image there, just in numerical sense. So you think using this method, we actually can tweak the parameters. We can tweak the architecture parameters, all of them very easily, because we have a very um, good computational platform and we can reach the best possible habitat system. Up, I mean, you know, like we need, a, we need the best habitat because we need our astronauts to uh, send selfie from there instead of thinking about the life all the time. So yeah, uh, that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Adnan. Okay, I will be putting uh, another a link to the People's Choice Survey into the chat.
So while John does that, I just want to uh, chime in and say everybody did such a fabulous job. I learned a lot in a very short, brief period of time. Uh, you're all pros and you can teach us on the faculty a lot of the work, how to present, how to make it very clear. Really appreciate it. Thank you all so much. And I don't envy the judges their job. It's going to be a very close competition. So all the best to everybody. Thank you, Dr. Matur. Um, everyone did such a wonderful job. And I really want to first uh, thank all of the students, the student presenters. You did such an excellent job. This is the first time we've done this and everything ran other than a few technical issues, which is nobody's fault. Uh, everyone was ready to go and turning the camera on and unmuting yourself. Very much appreciate everyone following the instructions to make this run very smoothly. I would also like to thank our judges. Um, if the judges want to pop on and give any, we have a couple minutes if you want to give any just final comments, um, if you want to turn on your cameras and pop on. And actually, everybody, if you want to turn on your cameras, it's fine at this point. And we'll go with uh, with Tracy first, if you want to give any final comments. Yeah, I was just going to say everything worked really smoothly. You obviously put in a lot of work to your presentation. Some of the visuals were actually great. I would probably reach out to you to help you uh, put my presentations together. So thank you for all your hard work. Uh, Jake? Um, this was really awesome. It was really cool. And it's interesting being on the other side. So I did the presentation last year, and I know the stress and the anxiety of trying to fit all of your work into a very short time period. You all did an amazing job and you made my job being on the other side this year quite hard, but it was really cool hearing about everybody's presentations, their work and their efforts. And it, it was it was a great day. I'm glad I got a chance to hear about that. So good job, everyone. Thanks, Jake. Daryl. First of all, take a deep breath, right? For those of you that just presented, I'm sure that you're like, <sighs> so congratulations to each of you excellent presentations. It's wonderful to hear all of the different things that are happening around campus at the graduate level. So my best of luck to each of you and continued success. It is difficult, uh, definitely um, coming up. So I know that the scores are going to be very, very, very close, um, but uh, great job. And uh, I wanna encourage you to continue to share this work. Um, you know, go to a, the next level, perhaps a publication, maybe a, another a conference level uh, type of event where you can share the work that you're doing. So uh, keep going uh, and congratulations again on your effort. Thanks, Daryl. Michelle? And this is my first time judging this type of competition and uh, it was really tough. Um, I really appreciated the creativity I saw on the slides and you could you can see and feel the passion in the room um you know as as the students as the candidates talked about their topics i feel like i learned a lot feel i feel smarter after spending all this time these past two hours with all of you and wish all of you the best of luck on your research thanks michelle nikki okay it doesn't look like nikki's here so i'm gonna uh just let you all know that I will be tabulating the judges scores this afternoon. We will be announcing the winners uh, tomorrow at the Graduate Student Appreciation Week Awards Ceremony from noon to one. Um, uh, for the competitors, if you have not registered for it yet, you have number, a number of emails from me with the link to register. So make sure you attend. Again, everyone, wonderful job. You made my job so much easier. So, um, and you know, thank everyone for attending today and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks, everybody.